Welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone here today. Um, this webinar is also co-sponsored by openchannels.org and the Marine Ecosystems and Management Newsletters. And we have Nick Weiner from uh, Open Channels representing those groups. He's also uh, co-hosting. Um, and uh, we'd like to welcome here today Rob Brumbaugh uh, from the Nature Conservancy who's going to be speaking about mapping ocean wealth. Um, before we get started with the presentation, I wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions. So there's two ways to ask questions. Um, you can type in questions into the question panel of the user interface. Uh, these questions we'll see throughout the webinar, um, sort of short uh, clarifying questions as to like what an acronym stands for. We would go ahead and we could go ahead and ask Rob during the presentation, but more substantive questions we'll hold till the end um, and for the, the question and answer period at the end. Um, and then also during the question and answer period, you, you also have the option of raising your virtual hand. There's a little hand icon in your user interface. You can raise your virtual hand and I'll unmute you and you could ask the question directly to Rob. So uh, in the Q&A uh, period at the end, either one works, typing it in or raising your virtual hand and being unmuted. So anyway, uh, welcome everyone, and uh, Rob, we're really glad you could be here today. I'll turn it over to you now. Very good. Well, thank you very much, Sarah, for the invitation to present uh, to the Ecosystem-Based uh, uh, Management Tools Network and to share a little bit about our Mapping Ocean Wealth Project. I hope folks find it interesting, and uh, I look forward to the discussion at the end of the presentation because that's actually something that, um, that uh, we feel would greatly help us to uh, greatly improve the project as we continue onward. So thanks very much for this opportunity and thanks to everyone for joining in today. Again, my name's uh, Rob Brumbaugh. I'm with the Global Oceans team with the Nature Conservancy and I am based in the Nature Conservancy's Florida Keys office today where I'm, uh, I have to say it is not the sunny Florida Keys that most people have in mind. Um, it's, a, it's a rainy day here, so what a great way to spend um, a bit of my time here this afternoon uh, chatting with all of you about this project. So just a little bit of an overview so you know uh, the sort of sequence of things here um, in the first half or so of this uh, webinar, I'm intending to leave a, a good portion for discussion after the conclusions here. But um, it's important to know what uh, we mean by ocean wealth, what the project is about. So I'll describe a little bit of, of the history and the, the run up to this project, what it is and importantly what it's not. And I'll take you through a little bit of our uh, sort of the background information about how we're putting on the map ecosystem services or ecosystem benefits, uh, what we've dubbed ocean wealth. Um, share with you some of the data and the tools that we've developed for communicating our results and the information that we have uh, so far. And this is very much a work in progress. So there'll be more and more information uh, generated through this project and hopefully with uh, more and more help from more and more people, including folks on this webinar. So with toward the end, we'll share some of our early results and what we think are some of the uh, ways to apply this information. And, and this in particular is a great opportunity to get feedback from others on what else we might uh, do to uh, put this kind of information to work. I am uh, very pleased to thank our sponsors, the financial supporters for this work, include the Lida Hill Foundation, the Carnival uh, Corporation Foundation, and Microsoft as part of their Upgrade uh, Your World initiative. So mapping ocean wealth, it's a snappy title. Uh, it probably means different things to different people at first glance. Certainly the term wealth um, uh, suggests to people that we're talking about money or economic value, and to a certain degree we are, but in a significant um, a way we are not just talking about the ocean's uh, wealth, but rather how the ocean produces benefits, where those benefits are produced, and what that tells us about what we can do to make sure that we uh, realize those benefits not only today but uh, in the future as well. 
Now, I have to, uh, I put this screen up, uh, this list of folks up at, at great risk because this, the moment you start uh, putting people's names on the screen the, is the moment you realize you've left many, many others off. But this is just to show you that this is a quite a diverse uh, group of individuals and organizations working together on this project. There's folks from the Nature Conservancy's uh, field and global programs. There's folks from universities, from development uh, banks uh, and others all uh, participating in various ways in an advisory capacity, in a science research and development capacity, in an outreach capacity. So um, just want to acknowledge that this is a, a great big um, effort and um, uh, there's many, many hands at the pump as, as it were. And this gives you an idea of all those folks on that list and others, there's sort of a constellation of organizations that are uh, either producing this information, using this information, or helping to communicate this information out to the rest of the world. And that is sort of by design how we've structured this project. It's partly about uh, creating new information, doing um, the kind of science that we think is, is necessary to translate maps of ecosystems and habitats into maps of ecosystem benefits. But importantly, it's, um, it's necessary to get that word out through a variety of communication channels, including webinars like this. And then put that information to work in uh, various ways that in a box we just sort of called policy for shorthand. But basically, we're trying to inform decisions, whether it's decisions by corporations, decisions by countries, or decisions by individuals about how they should uh, behave or treat uh, ecosystems around us. So let's start off by uh, taking stock of what the ocean is worth. Now, there are uh, a number of studies out there, um, starting with the seminal uh, paper on ecosystem services at a global scale by uh, Costanza et al. in 1997, that help us to um, put a number on what the ecosystem um, services are worth for just the ocean. So, uh, Costanza et al.'s paper uh, puts that at about $21 trillion in 1994 dollars. Um, an update to that paper uh, not long ago uh, raises that to about $60 trillion and a, a paper a report uh, produced by the World Wildlife Foundation um, uh, Fund uh, earlier this year puts that at about $24 trillion. But those numbers are all big. They're all in the same ballpark. They all tell us basically one thing that the ocean has a tremendous importance to us in just economic terms. But what those numbers don't really tell us is where that value is produced or where it's distributed or what essentially to do about it. Now, at the other extreme, there are studies um, like uh, this one that there's a, a value of $1.9 million assigned to a single shark because of its appeal to scuba divers in Palau. So that's sort of the other end of the extreme um, from the value of the entire ocean to the value of a single animal in a single place. Now what that sort of starts to take us toward is this notion that those great big numbers, those 20 and 40 and 60 trillion dollar figures for the value of the entire ocean is not evenly distributed. It's not uh, uh, the same everywhere because this, as this example suggests, sharks don't occur everywhere. They are not evenly distributed. They're concentrated uh, in places, and in this example, in places that are accessible to divers. So clearly we need to better understand how the value or the wealth of the ocean is produced, where it's produced, and how it's produced. And that really is the, the purpose of this particular project, Mapping Ocean Wealth. Now, it's, it's useful, I think, to think about um, uh, how to get to value. And really, you start with how the ecosystem service is produced in the first place. So at the top of the screen, in the box labeled supply, there's a scuba diver counting fish along a transect. It's that kind of information that helps us understand how a particular coral reef in a particular place produces fish, for example. 
if you think about what that means to society, the service that that's uh, ultimately providing is the ability to catch a fish, for example, or if you're a recreational diver, the ability to go see a fish or photograph a fish like a shark. So the service is actually the supply, the way the ecosystem produces that fish, plus its location and its proximity to people. As that fisherman uh, would, would certainly attest, he's not looking to paddle his canoe very far. He needs, he needs this fish to be produced someplace where he can uh, access them. The value of those fish, in turn, comes, among other ways, through a market, which is the supply, the service, and the social preferences. Only certain fish are uh, deemed valuable in a marketplace, for example, or other, certain, other fish are valuable because they are um, uh, targets for underwater photographers. So understanding that the ecosystem produces a benefit, the, um, where that ecosystem produces that benefit or supplies that benefit helps us, uh, and the proximity to people provides the service, and the value is then the service plus um, a social preference. So um, this project, Mapping Ocean Wealth, is primarily focusing in on the supply box on this, uh, on this screen, really understanding how ecosystems produce those services in the first place. And that's in large part a, um, uh, related to their ecological function and their structure and other, and other attributes that are specific to those ecosystems in those locations. We are going out as far as understanding where those services or where those um, services are produced in relation to people. Um, we are, in some instances, taking this all the way out to value. But what we found is is that the critical information that is currently most lacking in the ecosystem service sphere or arena, if you will, is an understanding of how ecosystems produce those benefits in the first in the first place. We came to this realization a few years ago as we were working on restoring oyster reefs to various estuaries around the United States. And quite often we were asked by funders, well, we support oyster reef restoration. We think there should be more and more healthy oyster reefs. But what we'd like to know is how much is enough? When will you be done restoring oyster reefs to a given estuary? So that prompted us to um, approach that question sort of with a question, which is what should we be striving to return to these estuaries? In this example, in this slide, we were able to home in on and develop the ability to predict the filtration capacity of oyster reefs, the amount of water filtered by oysters as they were feeding. Uh, tells us um, something about the ecosystem integrity or the health of that estuary. And so by knowing how big the reefs were, how many oysters were there, what size the oysters were, we were able to create algorithms or equations that allowed us to predict a certain amount of filtration per hectare or per acre was possible in a given estuary, and then literally put that on the map. And so with this, we can start to see at least at estuary scales, which estuaries have a lot of filtering uh, capacity and which estuaries don't, but perhaps with restoration uh, could, uh, could once again have a lot of oyster reef filtration capacity and help us answer the question, when will we be done? So the way we accomplish that um, is then the way we're approaching this entire project, and I'm going to show you an example of how we've estimated uh, carbon storage from mangroves is basically review, model, map. Literature review um, uh, for a lot of these ecosystems, whether it's mangroves or coral reefs or oyster reefs or seagrass beds, shows that there's, there's lots and lots of information buried in uh, scientific articles, in gray literature, in filing cabinets um, that give us the sort of nuggets of wisdom, the nuggets of information that you need to create an algorithm to start fitting curves to the size of reefs, the, uh, the biomass of a, of a reef and its filtration capacity in the case of that oyster reef example I showed a moment ago, or the latitude, the climatological information um, that allows you to predict the uh, size of mangroves of, of different species uh, in the case of mangroves and carbon storage. 
So pouring over the scientific literature allows us to um, uh, pull out the kind of information we can use to develop an algorithm, a model uh, that is of a predictive nature that we can then apply to global or really any spatial scale, regional or local uh, map layers to translate the map of mangrove extent into a map of mangrove uh, above ground carbon in this case. And by extension, you could actually uh, um, predict the below ground uh, carbon uh, with a bit more um, information from the literature. So we went from being able to predict uh, on a bay by bay basis something like uh, oyster reef filtration capacity to this global map uh, of above ground carbon storage for mangroves. And that really was the start of this project called Mapping Ocean Wealth, where we would, where we would endeavor to um, map against the various types of uh, habitats like mangroves, coral reefs, shellfish uh, reefs, and seagrass meadows, pelagic ecosystems like upwelling zones, various services like coastal protection or wave attenuation, tourism benefits like recreational fishing, for example, fisheries for food purposes, carbon storage, and even water purification or denitrification. So those services or those benefits across the top, uh, we think we can map against all of these uh, various kinds of ecosystems which, for which we already have, in the most, for the most part, uh, global or at least regional or local maps. And so just to give you a, a quick glimpse at a, a first cut at um, what this looks like, I've already showed you the carbon above ground biomass uh, map at a global level. We also have estimates of uh, coastal protection, uh, which essentially is um, uh, wave attenuation uh, by, by uh, coral reefs. Um, fish production by coral reefs, mangrove uh, fish production by um, uh, mangroves, and tourism uh, benefits associated uh, with coral reefs. And just to show you what those maps um, look like at a um, at a regional uh, level, in this case the um, uh, the Coral Triangle, uh, Indonesia. Um, you can see what those what those um, various services look like when they're when they're translated at to, at to that scale. Uh, this is information that's that's available online in a uh, paper by uh, Mark Spalding et al. It was presented at the World Parks Congress uh, in 2014, um, and uh, actually in that paper what we uh, what we presented was not only a, a look at what it's what a map of ecosystem services looks like, but the question: How much of those services currently falls within marine protected areas in the world? So that is a, a bit of a glimpse at how we think this information can be put to use. So we've been communicating the results of this uh, project in various ways. There's a, a quite a number of scientific publications that are now available uh, on the web, on our website, which I'll, uh, is oceanwealth.org, and I'll show you that um, what that looks like a, a little bit more in the next slide or two. Um, we've also established a, a Twitter feed, and I, I hope everybody is following us, and if you're not, that you will follow us at, at ocean underscore wealth, um, because we expect this to be a, a conversation on an ongoing basis about how to improve uh, the way we map these kinds of ecosystem services. Um, we've also produced some infographics that are available for download to make it easy to uh, convey this information visually and quickly to um, uh, a variety of audiences. So I mentioned we have a website, it's oceanwealth.org, that explains our approach, uh, what we're trying to map, what we've um, succeeded in mapping thus far, uh, the team that's involved, and then um, very importantly, um, and this is really where the ecosystem-based uh, management tools network, I think, should be interested, is the mapping portal. The button at the upper right uh, side of our uh, primary website or our first page has a button called mapping portal, and that um, portal takes you into uh, or behind the scenes. Oops, let me put, put myself back on. Um, to actually take you into a mapping uh, portal where you can access the data that we are producing um, 
almost literally as we're producing it. Um, so we have, once you go into this, um, to this data portal, uh, and I'll take you for a little bit of a tour here so you can uh, get a feel for what's available and how to use it, but it'll take you into um, a global and regional set of, of maps and data and services. Um, I'll highlight that, um, let's see, along the left side of our data portal is a scroll bar that will allow you to uh, peruse the different kinds of services that we're trying to map, whether it's fisheries, coastal protection, or uh, as this slide has uh, illustrated, recreation and tourism associated with coral reefs, specifically in the Coral Triangle, for example. Um, take you for a little bit of a tour here. When you first go into the mapping portal, what you'll see is a getting started screen uh, that's shown here on the, uh, on the slide. And that um, getting started screen allows you to explore the map globally or pick among any number of regions where we are uh, taking a, bit of bit, a little bit of a deeper dive like the Caribbean, Coral Triangle, Gulf of California, Micronesia, and so forth. Or, uh, and this will increase over time, we've produced a number of what's called one-click interactive maps. Coastal tourism value in the Caribbean, modeled um, coral reef connectivity or larval transport in the Caribbean are examples of one-click maps. Um, that you can go straight to. If you start at a global scale, um, and um, this map shows uh, that you can pull up, if you go to our Blue Carbon Ecosystem Service and pull up mangroves and then click on model value of above ground storage, that will take you to maps and allow you to zoom in um, using these buttons uh, on the left side of the screen. You can zoom into any particular place um, to a point where we think the resolution um, uh, is limited um, by basically the underlying data. But it's still pretty high resolution. Now, the, the thing that we're starting to see already just with some of the data sets that we've put up uh, to begin with is just how much spatial variation there is among these uh, services and from place to place. And I don't think that's a, it's terribly surprising, but we think it's very, very useful because um, we think it's that kind of information that allows us to make decisions about where to invest a dollar in restoration or carbon storage or uh, coastal protection um, services and benefits, for example. Taking a, a little bit of a, a, a closer look at that, same data, same uh, data layers, but zoomed in to the Coral Triangle. That's actually, you can see where most of this above ground uh, mangrove carbon is found. And uh, again, you can see that there's quite a bit of variation even at a regional or national level. And we think that that's the kind of information, again, that, that um, really has value, so to speak. Going back out to that uh, first getting started map, I just wanted to show you what one of these one-click interactive maps looks like if you were to click on the modeled coral reef, uh, coral larvae transport uh, button. It would uh, take you into a map that um, looks uh, something like this, uh, depending on um, which of these uh, uh, connectivity data layers you've uh, clicked on or off. So a map like this tells us um, an awful lot about the relationship between different reefs when it comes to the uh, transport of larvae between them, the strength of the, of the connection, for example. So it really helps us to better see that protecting reefs in one place may in fact be dependent on protecting reefs in a completely different location um, if we're expecting them to remain connected and larvae to be going back and forth uh, between them. Okay, taking you back out um, to um, another service, recreation and tourism. And again, you would get to this by the left on the left side of the screen, selecting recreation and tourism. When you select these services uh, buttons, whether it's fisheries or coastal protection or recreation and tourism, the first thing that comes up is an infographic that gives you just a little bit of background information. You can also uh, print this out, by the way, from our website. Um, 
If you go to the continue button on the bottom uh, lower right side of that infographic and, and click continue, that then will take you to, um, to uh, the actual data layers that you can then click on and off. Um, and again, you can uh, pick a regional level or a global level to view these kinds of uh, modeled uh, ecosystem benefit data. And again, like mangrove uh, carbon storage, above ground carbon storage, you can see that there's quite a lot of variation in this particular service as well. So um, again, that tells us quite a bit about um, where we might uh, need additional protection, where we might want to focus uh, investments on restoration uh, or say pollution control to make sure that the most valuable reefs are receiving the, the kind of protection that they need to be um, uh, protected from uh, water quality problems, for example. Um, you can export your maps once you've created them um, using the button at the lower left of the screen that says export page. Uh, once you've sort of aligned your map and created the, the opened the data layers that you uh, that you're, um, have an interest in, choosing that will then open a dialog box that allows you to create your own title and determine which orientation you'd like, landscape, portrait, uh, whether you want the uh, uh, data layer uh, legend included or not. And, um, and that then allows you to export that map as a page uh, with the title of your choosing. At some point in the Hopefully not too distant future, we will make these, uh, these kinds of data available for export um, as uh, shapefiles and data, uh, uh, data tables. Uh, but at this point, where we've started was uh, giving people the ability to create and export your own maps. So that is uh, a glimpse at what uh, kind of services we're trying to map. Um, what those maps at this stage in the project uh, already are looking like at a global and in some cases regional level. Um, what we're really trying to do though is not just do science for science sake, um, although we are advancing the science in a pretty significant way we think, um, but we want to put this information to work and we'd like to help others put it to work as well. As this slide shows, the oceans are a busy, busy place. We expect an awful lot from them whether it's energy production, transportation of goods, uh, biodiversity uh, protection, recreation and fisheries, all manner of, of, um, of benefits are expected from the ocean. And increasingly, uh, this is making the ocean a very crowded place. And so in a lot of places, ocean use planning or marine spatial planning is underway where uh, we are able to make decisions on a more proactive basis about how to allocate space, how to make decisions about uh, where certain activities should be focused or where they should be perhaps steered away from. And so we actually have uh, invested some of this uh, mapping ocean wealth funding in the places shown on this map um, to better understand not only how to put ecosystem benefits on the map, but how to put those uh, benefits, uh, benefit maps to work in planning um, and policy uh, frameworks that are underway as, as we speak. So all along the U.S. Atlantic coast, for example, there are regional ocean governance partnerships, each with their own data portals and uh, with um, a variety of planning processes underway in various stages of development, um, all aiming toward making um, sort of rational, proactive decisions about uh, what benefits we're trying to um, focus on protecting and delivering into the future. And that's true basically of all of these places. And there's many more places in the world where that kind of ocean use planning is underway and where we think um, this, has, uh, this kind of information should be of great value. Another sort of more global and national uh, scale opportunity, we think, is thinking about the Convention on Biological Diversity and some of the recent uh, current targets um, under the Convention on Biological Diversity. The target 11 talks about how much, of, um, how much additional ocean conservation and protection is needed. Quite a lot of focus is placed on the very first part of this particular 
uh, so-called uh, ACHI target. Um, a lot of people focus on 10% of coastal and marine areas uh, should be protected and then just stop there. But really, if you read this entire uh, ACHI target, it says much more than that. Um, it talks about areas of particular importance for biodiversity and ecosystem services, meaning that not just any 10% uh, is okay, but rather 10% or more of the ocean um, should be protected with a very uh, clear consideration to the kinds of ecosystem services and benefits that people receive and um, with an equi equitable distribution of those benefits. So we think that there's an opportunity for example for nations to determine of the areas that they've protected within their own national boundaries where do the ecosystem services uh, lie with respect to the areas that they've focused their protection on. Um, by extension then, if we have made decisions, in this case I'm showing a map of the uh, bird's head seascape in Indonesia where uh, a network of marine protected areas has been created under the uh, national a marine protected area network uh, plan through the Coral Triangle Initiative, it's important to make sure that those marine protected areas are managed and um, management requires funding. So there are visitor fees, for example, um, that are uh, applied um, to people who visit the, that place to go diving, for example. Recently those fees were raised from $50 to $100 and um, there's been no apparent reduction in visitation to the area, which is good news. I guess that's not terribly surprising in that the that coral reefs generate billions of dollars annually globally uh, just in recreation and tourism uh, revenue. But understanding how those marine protected areas are delivering different kinds of services helps to justify um, those kinds of uh, investments in protection and support the creation of sustainable financing um, mechanisms like visitor fees. A little bit closer to home for me, I'm um, speaking with you today from the Florida Keys, is another example of um, sustainable financing for, in this case, coral restoration that's, uh, that's uh, um, emerging here in the Florida Keys. Coral reefs in the Florida Keys are uh, perhaps not as healthy as they should be, and there's been an increasing focus on restoring a couple of key species in the photograph shown on the right is staghorn coral, uh, which is a, a very, very important um, species of coral. It's actually on the uh, listed as um, on the endangered species list um, in the United States and territories. Fury Water Sports, which is a, a local tour operator um, uh, based in Key West, is donating one dollar per passenger toward coral reef restoration. I would suggest that um, this kind of information produced by Mapping Ocean Wealth would help us to target where those restoration dollars are spent. For example, if we know that uh, restored reefs reduce wave energy or produce more fish or have higher tourism value, that kind of spatially explicit information allows us to make uh, good strategic decisions about how to target those, those dollars. So uh, in sort of wrapping things up here and opening up the discussion, um, this kind of information we think has great value to uh, inform investment decisions in things like restoration, I just mentioned and conservation. And this is true of uh, whether we're talking about public funding or private sector funding. Corporations make investment decisions all the time about how to reduce their carbon footprint or increase their sustainability. Uh, as a corporation and so we think that there's uh, lots of opportunities to put this kind of information to work in shaping those investment dollars. Indeed, um, the, the, uh, the dollars spent by the Nature Conservancy and other conservation groups can be informed and targeted uh, based on this kind of information. Sustainable funding mechanisms for management of areas that are put under conservation like marine protected areas in the bird's head seascape. Um, can be strengthened and bolstered um, uh, based on this kind of information. Uh, we think that new investments in things like pollution abatement, um, reducing the impacts of uh, poorly or untreated wastewater, for example, uh, could be um, strengthened and targeted uh, based on where reefs, for example, or mangroves or seagrass beds um, are producing the highest benefits for people but are at the highest risk 
for damage from uh, poor or untreated uh, wastewater. So for every new dollar in wastewater treatment um, that's uh, being put forward, perhaps we could uh, sharpen uh, the way we target the, the location for those investments. Um, I already mentioned that uh, ocean use planning or marine spatial planning is underway. This is just another kind of information that we think would be of great value in a spatial, uh, spatially explicit uh, basis. Um, and then ultimately, uh, as nations report their progress toward uh, goals like ACHI Target 11 under the Convention on Biological Diversity, we think there's an opportunity to put this information to work um, there as well. Certainly, there's many, many others, uh, many, many other ways to put this information to work. There's many, many opportunities to improve the information that we're producing. And um, I guess with that, I will um, close the presentation and turn it back over to uh, Nick and Sarah uh, for moderating questions from, um, from the attendees. Okay, great. Thank you, Rob. This was great. Um, we have a couple questions already here oh, and more coming. Um, and I just wanted to remind everyone you can uh, type questions in the question panel of the user interface and um, Nick and I will relay them to Rob. Or you can raise your virtual hand and I'll unmute you and you can ask the question directly to Rob. OK, so let's see. Um, one of the first questions that came in was what, it, what type of quality assurance and quality control is done with the underlying data? I'm sorry, uh, Sarah, can you repeat that question? Yes. Uh, what sort of uh, quality assurance and quality control is done with the underlying data? Right. Yeah. It, um, obviously, the, the maps will only be as good as, as the underlying data. Um, we've been very, very careful to put all of the metadata into, um, include the metadata in uh, all of our data sets. So um, ultimately, when you are, when we do make that functionality available, you'll be able to see for any given data set where the data came from, uh, where, how it was uh, ground truth, um, contact information, and, and the like. Um, so I guess there's, there's a couple of different parts to that as well. One is the spatial information about the ecosystems themselves, and we're relying very, uh, very much on um, WCMC and the, uh, the kinds of global data sets <clears throat> that um, are out there for maps of, say, mangroves or coral reefs. Um, we know that the resolution of those uh, data is limited, and so we are putting sort of limits on the resolution of the uh, ecosystem service maps that are well matched to the resolution of the underlying map information, um, if that makes sense, habitat information. Um, the, uh, the algorithms themselves, uh, each one of these uh, maps uh, depends on um, a lot of hard work by, you know, in some cases, teams of people. We're trying to put all of those production functions into the peer-reviewed literature so that people can take a very close look at the assumptions uh, that we make, the kinds of data that we're making use of, and make suggestions for how to improve that over time. Okay. Thank you, Rob. Um, let's see. Next question. How are recreation and tourism values determined and mapped? Are they based on national statistics or natural capital? No, sorry, the natural capital's recreation and tourism model. Both. Um, so, actually, the tourism uh, work that we've done thus far actually has been a, a terrific collaboration between the World Resources Institute, the Natural Capital Project, and uh, our team uh, in Cambridge, uh, University of Cambridge. And so, um, there are national statistics um, uh, on arrivals and expenditures and the like, but there's also um, information that uh, tourists provide to us even more directly through things like uh, Flickr photographs, uh, for example. And, and that's um, some terrific work um, that Spencer Woods and, and Loretta Burke and Mark Spaulding have been uh, collaborating on uh, to produce this kind of information about tourism value at, at the global scale um, for coral reefs. Okay, great. Thank you, Rob. Uh, next, uh, let's see. It's great to hear that you plan to make the data available by way of an export function. In the meantime, is it possible to post all the data so they can be downloaded at the global scale? 
Um, this is where my technical knowledge is probably uh, the question exceeds my my technical understanding and knowledge of our of our data portal. Quite frankly, um, the short answer is I think yes. Um, the longer answer is um, if someone wishes to um, uh, work with the data directly, they should send me an email, and I can try to make the right connections within our team. Okay. All right. Thank you. See. Next, is there a conflict between highest value to people and highest value to the ecosystem or ecosystem functioning? Um, potentially, yes. This um, this is a really interesting and new way to look at the world around us from a conservation standpoint. Now, one thing I want to make clear is that um, we are not abandoning biodiversity for biodiversity's sake as a conservation objective. Uh, at the Nature Conservancy, but rather trying to put forward an additional argument, an additional lens for uh, paying close attention to the kinds of ecosystems that do produce a lot of value for people as, again, an additional argument for conservation. So um, it is an interesting uh, new pathway for a conservation organization to work. Um, by looking at um, the value for people, which again uh, probably suggests that we're going to turn um, our attention to places that are and ecosystems that are closer rather than uh, further away from people. But again, this is not an either or, it's not uh, biodiversity and pristine places um, or places that are close to people. But it's a, it's a way of sharpening our focus um, into some of the places that do happen to be close to people and of, of great importance to people. Okay. Great. Thank you, Rob. Uh, let's see. Next. Hi from Woods Hole. I am wondering if you could talk a bit about whether Mapping Ocean Wealth is engaged in projects for the deep ocean, for example, in the area, um, the seabed areas beyond national jurisdiction. No, we are not, uh, but not for lack of interest. It's really more a lack of capacity um, at this point in time, and if there is an opportunity to collaborate with or to encourage others to pick up that baton and carry that forward, we would really, really like to see that happen. Um, we do know that uh, areas beyond national jurisdiction are uh, places where, for example, there is an increasing focus on deep sea mining. Um, offshore energy exploration and the like, and so uh, to the extent that there are um, good base maps of the habitats or the underlying geology against which we could create uh, models of ecosystem function and, and apply them, uh, I think that would be a fantastic thing to do. I'd love to, I'd love to talk more about that and, and see what we could do to collaborate. Okay, and there was um, there actually ended up being two questions um, sort of in that realm, so there are a couple of people interested in that. Yeah. Um, let's see. When calculating ecosystem service values for different regions, do you take into account the differences between individual species found in those regions? For example, certain species of mangroves may sequester more carbon than others. Yes, uh, we do. Um, if you, there is a terrific paper by uh, James Hutchison et al. In uh, I think that was published in 2014 in Conservation Letters, that talks a lot about well gives uh, all of the backstory on that uh, modeling uh, effort that I showed earlier in the in the presentation. Um, so it is going to depend on um, the differences between species, how they respond to climatological. Uh, 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 characteristics, for example. Sarah, you there? Yes, I'm here. Oh, sorry. So, yeah. so sorry. Okay. Yeah, All right. Thanks. I muted myself and I was talking as we discussed earlier. Okay, uh, so our next question. Uh, do you have any evidence that ocean wealth maps have been used or assisted government or local environmental planning agencies in prioritizing projects or project alternatives? Um, I guess 
in not directly just yet. Um, this project uh, really is just now hitting its stride, and uh, we are putting the information to work in different places, um, uh, really as we speak. So. Um, whether there's, I guess I would say there isn't um, a, a uh, story of how this has shaped a decision just yet, but I know that the information is being imported into uh, planning uh, exercises um, in real time. So if, that, if you ask me that question in a year from now, I, I'm quite confident the answer will be yes, and here's the five places and five examples. Okay, great. Um, well, we look forward to hearing from you in a year about those. Great. Okay. And let's see, another question. The focus uh, on ecosystem services and benefits to people as well as nature are similar to the conceptual basis of the Ocean Health Index. Can you talk about how ocean wealth might interact with the Ocean Health Index? Yeah, that is uh, actually quite high on my to-do list. Um, and we have uh, been um, uh, exploring a little bit and having some uh, back and forth discussion about how to create some linkages here because I think there's terrific opportunities to, to do so. Um, the, I guess one of the things we've been trying to do is make this uh, a very, this project about the spatially explicit uh, basis of ecosystem function and ecosystem benefit uh, production um, or service production. And that differs a little bit from um, just uh, sort of the, the more gross uh, estimates of ecosystem health and value at, say, a national scale. So we're trying to be a little bit more spatially explicit, at least in my, in my perception, than the Ocean Health Index um, uh, at this point in time. But again, I think there's great opportunities for making a good connection there. Okay, great. Um, and let's see, the last one we have now, so just a warning to everyone, uh, if you uh, want to get a question in, go ahead and, and send it now. Um, let's see. I enjoyed your focus on the global distribution of ocean wealth. I'm currently researching the economic importance of global fisheries, primarily in terms of observation. I think I got that right. Uh, do you have any recommendations of projects or groups who are doing similar global ocean valuation work, but in terms of the distribution of global fisheries employment benefits? Hmm. Um, yes. Uh, I guess I would point you to uh, a couple of people that are part of our uh, Mapping Ocean Wealth team. So Linwood Pendleton has been working closely with us as well as a postdoc, Valia Dracou. Um, both Linwood and Valia are based at uh, the University of Western Brittany in France, and um, I would encourage you to um, reach out to them or contact me, and I can put you in touch with them about that kind of global fisheries and employment uh, benefits. Um, another member of our um, uh, external advisory team is uh, Dr. Tracy Rouleau at uh, NOAA, and uh, she also uh, could have some good suggestions um, there on global employment as it relates to fisheries. Okay, fabulous. And I did get it wrong when I was reading it, but you, you answered appropriately. It was on the, ec they were asking about the economic importance of global fisheries, primarily in terms of jobs. Okay. Uh, okay, we have a couple more questions now. Uh, hi, Rob. Can you tell us what is next for Ocean Wealth? How do interested partners connect? Well, um, interested partners can uh, contact me directly or get in touch with us uh, through our, our website, oceanwealth.org. Um, we really are trying to um, you know, take this to a, a second phase in the coming years where we put this kind of information to work. So we're exploring things uh, like um, the relationship between this kind of spatial information and, say, corporate sustainability reporting. A lot of major corporations, publicly traded corporations, are interested in improving their uh, sustainability as an organization and their, their contribution to global or regional sustainability, environmental sustainability, and social sustainability. And a lot of them report through things like the Global Reporting Index or the Carbon Disclosure Project. So right now, one of the things we're looking into is how to uh, make this kind of information 
most readily available and most useful for corporations um, that would like to invest more in or on the sustainability front. So that's one example of uh, where I think this is going. Um, I mentioned that uh, we think that this has great utility at the national scale for nations that would like to demonstrate um, their commitment to the Convention on Biological Diversity and their progress toward things like uh, the ACHI Target 11. Um, a lot of uh, countries report on their uh, the creation of uh, marine protected areas. One of the things that uh, we think this information can do for nations is to allow them to take stock of what's in those marine protected areas. And not only what's in them um, physically, but what is derived from those uh, marine protected areas, what benefits um, are protected, as it were. And we think that has great um, utility in making decisions about then what are you doing to manage that marine protected area and what kind of activities are you paying close attention to uh, from a management standpoint for those marine protected areas. So if we really do want to get to that, to the um, full uh, expression of that target, not just 10% area, but 10% area with a particular representative representation of ecosystem services. Uh, we think this information has, has value there. Those ACHI targets are um, we're about halfway there um, toward the 2020 uh, deadline, so I think there's a lot of opportunity to put this to work at national scales. Um, but again, as far as being involved, um, we are constantly looking to um, add to that uh, constellation of organizations that are contributing to this. Um, while this um, began with the Nature Conservancy, we don't necessarily look at it as a Nature Conservancy project. We look at, at it as a project to which the Nature Conservancy and many others are contributing. So please join. Okay, fabulous. So, and your contacts information there for anyone who wants to get in touch. Let's see, we have one more question. Um, does the Ocean Wealth Mapping Tool have the capability to incorporate outside data sources such as more localized uh, social science or environmental research? Uh, yes, uh, it does. Not probably through like a click here to add your data, but because we want to be sure that the data are uh, ground truth and, and um, appropriately uh, all the metadata is appropriately uh, captured. We do have a team that can take data from uh, any number of, of people and sources and upload it. Um, so it is designed to be a living, ongoing uh, site. And we have folks working on our team who can help with that. Uh, so again, please contact me and um, let's see what we can do to get your information represented. Okay. All right, Rob, this was fantastic. It was a, it's, it's a great project and uh, a great overview of it. Thank you very much for coming today, and thank you to everyone who was able to, to participate. We hope you can participate in future webinars, too. Um, yeah, so, Rob, uh, we'd love to hear an update in a year just about how uh, it's been used, so we look forward to hearing from you again. Very well. I, I will uh, look forward to that. Thank you for this opportunity, and thanks to everybody for tuning in. Great questions. Okay. Yeah, indeed. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye, all.